actually all these things here are pretty much connected, okay? So, but in, in the end, what I really want to talk about is not in the title, it's about the evolution of complexity. So, so the presentation, uh, first I will talk um, and define trade-off. Uh, I will give you um, exact an example of the trade-off. A very well-known example is the trade-off between uptake rate and yield of the process of conversion of resource into energy and then biomass. In the end, I present um, the approach we use to, to address the problem for the evolution of complexity. So we present our model, and that's important. You know, uh, we talk about the simulation protocol we use. I will describe the method we use to simulate the problem. Uh, we make important assumption for the model that the, the model, our aggregate always works in the optimized regime. So we need to describe that. And then we we'll talk about the outcomes of the model and the consequence for the evolution of complexity. Okay, so what, what's trade-off? Suppose we have uh, two traits, X and Y, and suppose that uh, you can fix one of them, okay? And then we can vary X, I increase X, and then I observe that the fitness or adaptation, which is related to reproductive rate, also increases. Then I fix X and vary Y, and then I also observe that increase in y, the fitness also augment. And, uh, but x and y are actually correlated, okay? So I cannot change x without mm, varying y, okay? So that's the trade-off, okay? If I increase one trait, that means the other trait is, is decreased, and also this has consequences to the fitness. That's not some. That's not bad. Okay, actually, trade-offs are very important in, in biology, and they they are responsible for the for most of the biodiversity we have uh, in Earth. Okay, it's you can easily observe these trade-offs when you look at the life history traits. Okay, so for example, we have a trade-off between survival and reproduction rate. You have um, trade-off between size and number of eggs. You have trade-off at the cell level between uptake rate and yield. And uh, that's an example, okay? So what you observe is that organisms, okay, that live longer, they usually okay, have few kids, while small organisms, they usually have many kids, okay? So this is rarely observed, and, and this is what is also poorly observed in nature. Okay, we have also trade-offs at the cellular level, basically because energy is finite, okay? So every time you need to carry out a biochemical process, you need energy, okay? And the energy is, is finite, so. So we also have um, the number of ribosomes is also finite, okay? So basically, and, uh, if you want to overexpress a given protein, okay, it means that other proteins are underexpressed. Okay? And the, in the end, you also have a, a limit of space, okay? The cell is, is also a maximum size, so they cannot go without bound. So all these things impose constraints at the process that are carried out inside, inside the cell. Okay, uh, multicellularity is, is known as one of the major transitions um, in the evolution, okay? So we have a transition at the time, okay? We have uh, the appearance of a new higher level of biological organization, okay? So this can be seen as the cooperation between lower left units, for example, multicellular organism, it uh, can be seen as the cooperation between 
single cells. Okay? So they decide to populate, and for some reason, it brings some adventure for everyone inside the, the aggregate. And, uh, and by natural selection, okay, this can grow and spread in nature. Okay, so, but the process is, is not unidirectional, okay? You don't have uh, only one force favoring the increase of, of organism, okay, increasing size, but you, ha you also have opposing force, okay? Usually you have genetic conflict, and genetic conflict acting in the other direction. Okay, uh, most, most cellular organisms, they, they can grow and they can replicate. And usually we observe two modes of life cycles in nature, okay? Uh, that's the most common mode. It's called clone development. So usually you have a single found, okay? And then the cell starts to divide, okay? And the daughter cells usually they are connected to the parent cells, and the organism starts to grow up to reaching a given size, and then usually they go through a unicellular stage and the process repeats again. In the other way, you have the aggregate, aggregative mode. This is less common, okay? But in this case, you can have different aggregates combined to form a larger aggregate. What's the problem with that? is this can lead to genetic conflict. In genetic conflict, you have um, some cells you know, cheating the others, and uh, they can somehow you know, destroy the organisms. They want to take advantage of the, of the cooperators, and, uh, and you need some other organisms to, to overcome this conflict. Okay, so, why did um, multicellularity occur? So, what we know now is that, uh, I mean, we conjecture, okay, is that the, fo the first I I hypothesis is that as the organisms grow, okay, it increases the level of protection, right? So, it, the, the, the cells, the single cells, are less vulnerable to, to other first to predators, and then that's the main adventure, okay? As the organism grows, there's a second step. The second step is the division of labor, okay? So in the beginning, the organisms, all the cells are indifferentiated, and after that, they start to, to divide you know, the, some of the, the tasks performed in the group. So it's believed that this step, the, the, the first step in the transition, it was completely random. It was an accident. So uh, some mutation crew that prevented this, the daughter cell to, to separate from the, the parent cell. Okay? And then this aggregate starts to grow. Here is just an image. You know, you have a uh, phagocytosis here. You have a... Uh, and a bacteria, you know, that behaves as a predator and trying to, to eat the, the pre, okay? So if the cell, this cell is part of a bigger, bigger organism, it's less vulnerable to, to, to this process. Okay, so the here are some images of cell bacteria, and today we have data that shows that this and bacteria were key players in evolution. We have uh, possibly cords that, that date from 2.3 billion years ago. Okay? So it's, it's thought that these organisms were the first multicellular organisms in Earth. Okay. Young cells, they, they are capable of performing different, different tasks but they need to switch the tasks over time, okay? So they cannot do two tasks uh, concomitantly, okay? So they need to switch all the time, and this is not efficient process. 
On the other hand, most cellular, most cellular organisms, they can do this. Eh? They can somehow well, part, uh, divide on all these tasks, and then you have a specialization. For, so one group does one task one, the other group does task two, and so on. So size, as the size increase, okay, this will lead to, to division of labor. Okay? The cells differentiate, and then the process, all the process become more efficient. Okay, today it's possible to, to produce multicellular organisms in lab, starting from single cells. We have uh, some lab experiment with yeast. In this case, the multicellular organisms, they form this snowflake-like structure, okay? which basically is a mud multiple branching structure, okay? So they grow multi-blades. In this case, it's interesting because they also observe the division of, in the beginning of the process, there's no division of labor, but after the, the, the aggregates, which are given signs, differentiation starts. And some cells, they develop apoptosis, which means that they, they, they kill them themselves. But what's the advantage of, of killing themselves? Is that this allows the aggregate to, to replicate faster. Okay? So somehow this is a kind of kinship selection. Okay? Or user sociality. Yeah? We discussed before. In this other example, these are the ex experiments. They have the formation yeah, of multiple organisms, but in this case, there's no differentiation. So the advantage of lumping together comes from because the, the cells here they can share some enzyme that's very useful for the degradation of sugar. In, the, in this case, it's uh, sucrose. Okay, so that's the real goal of the presentation. I want to talk this about this size complex rule. So the first thing is that the definition of complex is quite unclear, right? So what is complex? So we need a method. We need something to use as, as a process. So this is a, a topic of very intense debate in the literature. And uh, Mekshi is a very good guy. But he wrote, recently he wrote a book. It's called The First Law of Biology, where he claims that in the absence of any evolutionary constraint, diversity and complex are expected to grow. That's a natural tendency. Actually, the guy does very, very good research, but for me at least this, I mean, his argument was not so convincing, okay? Because in the end, he means that if you don't observe the growth of diversity, it's because there's something. Even if you don't know there's something underneath. So. Okay, so what's all the size complex rule? Okay, uh, this term was dubbed by by Bonner. Okay, so what he observes is that the larger the organisms, the larger is the number of functions that the organisms can be can be formed. Okay, this is not only observed in biology. Okay, so s size is related to the number of cells. Okay, and the number of functions, number of cell types. Okay, so now log log. Yeah, and uh, here it's also observed the same tense in the con in the context of social evolution. Okay, so larger cities, okay, they can spe specialize in more different functions, more different tasks. Okay, so now I'm talking about this specific trade-off. This is the trade-off between uptake rate and the use of the process of conversion of resource into energy, okay? As you see, that's a lot to do with the emergence of multicellularity. Okay, so it's experimentally observed, okay? Uh, negative correlation between uptake rate and the 
yield of this process of conversion. So the cells that can take more resource, okay, they they are very inefficient. Okay, so the process of conversion is very poor. Okay? On the other hand, the, the cells that have a lower uptake rate, they have a very, very high yield. So they can convert the same amount of resource into energy okay, more efficiently. Okay, you know that heterotroph organisms, they need uh, organic molecules uh, to, to, to grow and to, to keep their activities. This occurs by the breakdown of organic molecules. So basically, we have two modes of metabolism. Okay, we have fermentation and we have re respiration. In the fermentation, we have uh, we don't need o uh, oxygen. Okay, and uh, but the process of degradation of the sugar is not complete. Okay, it's partial. On the other hand, for re respiration, you need oxygen, but you have a very high yield in the process. So this guy is, can be described as the, efficient, the inefficient mode of metabolism, and this one as the efficient mode of metabolism. Okay, so basically, for each molecule of glucose, in respiration we can produce 36 ATP, Okay, which is a molecule that can be easily broken to and release energy to carry out any biological and any biochemical process within the cell. Okay. While in fermentation for each molecule of glucose you produce around two ATPs. As you can see the process is very very inefficient. Okay. But in the fermentation mode, the guys, the cells, can take as much food as they want, and in the end, they can even reach a higher rate of rep replication. Okay. okay, this a very important feature uh, of this about this trade-off is that. The appearance of the first multicellular organisms they coincide with the great oxygenation event. So we conjecture that the establishment and maintenance of this efficient mode of metabolism was only possible due to, to the emergence of the first multicellular organism. That's, that's the conjecture, conjecture we have. Okay, so this problem can be posed within the framework of ev evolution of cooperation. Okay, so and then a cooperator is someone that pays a cost and bring ad some advantage to other individuals. Okay, a defector is someone that has no cost. Okay, but can take advantage. Uh, of the other individual can take can take advantage of the cooperation. So the efficient mode of metabolism can be seen as the, the cooperator, while the inefficient mode can be seen as the defector. Okay? Why? Because this guy can deplete the environment. Okay? If the own defector will survive, there's a big chance you have depression of the environment, in the end, this can even lead to the tragedy of the commons and consequently the extinction of the whole population. Okay, so this problem has been studied uh, uh, for some years within the context of multi-level selection. Okay, so in the end, multi-level selection Okay, you have the cooperators and you have the defectors. Okay, and the, but these guys, they form groups. Okay, they form aggregates. So you have selection not only at the, le at the, at the cell level, but you have selection at the group level. So that's that's why we use this this term, multi-level. So. 
Okay, so you can see. So the idea underneath the multiple selection is that uh, as your group have more cooperators, okay, this can be beneficial for the group as as a whole, okay. So in the end, if the group has more cooperators, okay, the group can somehow uh, divide faster and take, take take advantage of this. Okay. The problem is that the cooperators inside the groups they cannot compete with the defector. Okay. Okay. So this structuring the formation of groups is required because we learn from evolutionary wave theory that in a homogeneous population, if you only have if you have cooperators and defector, the cooperator always goes to extinction. Okay. Okay, we have recently we have studied this problem. Uh, I have studied this problem with my students, and we propose a resource-based modeling. And uh, so resource is provided to the system, to the groups, and uh, the cells compete for the resource within the group. Okay? And uh, the defectors they size a large portion of the of the of the resource okay but as the group as the cells divide okay this also leads to to the growth to the growth of, of the group and the as when the group size reach a given threshold the group divides so we have selection at the at the level of the cell and you have selection at, at the group level okay we, we have shown, that's not the focus of our work, that the cooperator can only survive, we study a multi-level selection model and a homogeneous model. And we will show that the cooperator, the cooperator can only survive if they are structured, okay? But not, that's not the goal of, the, of our, our talk. So now we take a different approach. We, we which we we'll call the mechanistic approach for the evolution of multicellularity. So we assume that the cells can exist in its unicellular form or they can form aggregates, okay? These are the multicellular organisms. So we assume the four different processes. We assume aggregation, dissociation, reproduction, and death. And the cells have the potential to perform n tasks. Okay, so here is a sketch of the process. We have a, besides, we also assume that these aggregates have some specific shapes. So we consider the linear model, so they form a chain. Okay, they have a unidirectional, um, the growth is unidirectional. Uni we also assume that the, the groups are compact, that's the second model, okay? So they, is that, that's the hemispherical model, they form spheres. And we also study the case they form snowflake-like structures, which is a multi-branching multi structure. Okay, so in the linear model, if you have two chains, they can combine to form a, a large one, okay? And this, this is dissociation process, they can, the chain can be broken down and then form two, two new chains. In the cell death process, uh, they can, if, if the removed cell is, is in the extreme, you keep with the one structure, but the size is reduced. But if the cell is in another position, then you can get two new chains, okay? In the spherical model, um, so we make a restriction here. So we only consider aggregation of the sphere with one single cell, okay? Dissociation also produce a small sphere and one single cell, okay? Cell death just reduce the size, 
okay, of the sphere. And cellular production can either increase the group size or can produce the, the group with the same size plus one single cell. Okay? And it's not it's very difficult to tell what happens. So we, we really need to keep track of all structures in the simulation because it depends on the position. You can form main main new aggregates as all these process that take to occur. Okay, so we have uh, the linear module. The best example uh, are the cyanobacteria. Okay, usually you can easily find cyanobacteria that form these filamental structures. You have some examples of bacteria that behave like that form these spheres. And these snowflakes-like structure, they can be produced in lab under artificial selection. Okay, usually they they use uh, gravity constraint to to produce such structures. Okay, so how how do we simulate this? We consider all this process as chemical reactions. Okay, so that's a, the process of aggregation. So we have two aggregates, one of size L and another of size M, they combine to form a new aggregate, which is larger. Dissociation event, uh, we have a, a single aggregate, it occurs and you can produce two aggregates. Of course, we have the constraint that L plus M is equal to N. Cell death, okay, you can have, you can, in the case of chain, okay, you can produce two two new chains. In the case of of spheres, you have in the end you have only one sphere of a smaller size. In reproduction, you can have a uh, aggregate of larger size, or you can have the aggregate of same size plus one single cell. So, where does the structure come in? The structures important to estimate all these reaction constants, okay? Okay, so for the linear model, so this reaction constant is equal to a constant times sigma square, so sigma is defined as thickness, okay? So it's, so sigma two it's, you know, it's the probability that two, two cells, they keep connected, okay? Uh, and here I'm already considering the number of, of combinations in, in these constants, okay? In this physical model, okay? Remember that I told you that we consider the uh, aggregation of spheres with single cells, okay? So that's the number of single cells. And uh, this, this scale is important because the cross section, okay, is proportional to the volume over um, to the power of two to thirty, okay. Not the entire volume. Yeah? Dissociation, okay. So it depends on the number of bonds. Right? If you have a chain of size n, the number of bonds and N minus one. In the spherical model, we only consider that cells on the surface participate in the process. And in reproduction, it's where natural selection arises. Okay, so this quantity is the reproductive rate of the cell. I mean, we use the per capita reproductive rate, which is the mean fitness. Okay. So this quantity times L that gives the total fitness in the aggregate. And finally we have the the death rate, which is related just just related to the size of the organism. Okay, so to simulate the system we use Gillespie algorithm. Basically we need to know the time the next 
process of truth, reaction of truth, and which process? So we will need two random numbers. Okay, so P0 denotes the probability that no reaction occurs during this time interval T between T and T plus tau. Okay? And this, okay, this gives the probability that reaction mu occurs in this time interval. Okay? So that the, pro the product of these two quantities provides this joint probability, okay, of tau and mu. Okay, so the method, method consists in divide this interval tau, okay, into k sub-intervals of a very small width, and uh, the probability that no reaction occurs in a given sub-interval, okay, is 1 minus the sum, okay? Note that this is the, the time interval, epsilon, okay? And when I take this quantity, I suppose M reactions, okay? And I take this, this quantity to the power of K, this provides the, the, the probability that no reaction occurs in the entire interval tau, okay? We, t we take the limit of K tend to infinite, and we can approximate this by an exponential distribution. Okay, so this sum here over A, which is our K, right? uh, I define it as A, a naught is the total uh, reaction constant, right? reaction weight, okay? So in the end, we need one random number to, to calculate the time, next, uh, next, next reaction will, will take place, and I need another random number to, to know which reaction will take place, okay? So the first random number, from the first random number, I calculate ca tau, because we have an exponential distribution, it's very easy, and the second one, the random number times a naught, this, this total reaction rate, will fall inside a given beam here, and that provides the, the reaction. Okay, let's start with the case we only have two tasks, okay, two functions. So the cell has the potential to perform two functions, okay? Uh, and we assume that these two functions are essential, okay? There's a trade-off between these two functions. You can think, um, think of, you can think of metabol metabolite, for example, metabolite production. It's easy to visualize, okay? Suppose the cells produce metabolite X and metabolite Y, but that's, that's very costly, you know? It's very costly to produce both, okay? So when they produce both metabolites, it brings a net advantage, okay? And a benefit, which is given by the product between X and Y. Here is the expression level of uh, metabolite X, and here is the uh, expression level of the metabolite Y. Okay, the cost. Okay, the cost. I can define a function like this. So the main, the the idea underneath this is that uh, we assume that the cost goes much faster than the benefit. Okay. So in the end, the fitness of the organism. Okay, in this case, a single cell is given by the benefit minus the cost. Okay. We assume Cx equal to Cy, okay? Otherwise, the problem for large aggregates is very, is very complicated. It's not feasible. Uh, okay, that's for single cell. And for any cell aggregate, okay, we assume that the benefit is shared between among all the 
components, all the members of the aggregate, okay? But the, co the cost is individual, okay? So here is the per capita, the per capita, the production rate of the aggregate. So here is the benefit of a single cell, okay? And here I sum all the cost and divide by the number of cells. So that's the per capita reproduction rate. Okay, let's see, have a look in the case of two cell aggregate. So in this case, the reproduct reproductive rate is given by this. Okay, so as we have a symmetry between the two functions, okay, we use to the assumption of complete symmetry between the two cells, I will assume that x1 in the optimized regime is equal to y2 and is equal to pc, okay? And x2 in the optimized regime is equal to y1 in the optimized regime, is and that's equal to gamma, okay? So our function becomes a function of two, two variables, gamma and pc. Okay, for one cell, we see that the fitness is maximized when the expression level of x is roughly the same of y, okay? So the cell needs to produce both metabolites, okay? And the expression level is around one dot something, one dot two, and the maximum fitness is around zero dot nine. Okay? When we go to two cell aggregates, that point becomes a saddle point. Okay? And the maximum are here. Okay? So here we see there is cell specialization. That's division of labor. One cell produces metabolite X, the other cell produces metabolite Y. Okay? And we repeat all these two, all aggregate size. Okay, that's, uh, for that case, on two tasks, one important thing to remark is that uh, for the spherical model, the spherical model, we see that uh, as we increase the dissociation rate, it, it does not mean that we will reduce the size of the aggregate. Actually, there's a critical value of q, q minus, minus at which the aggregate reach the maximum size, okay? That's important because it, that's something very close to what happens in Radcliffe experiment with the snowflake structure, this experiment with yeast, where they see that the cells develop apoptosis because they want to, rep in the end, the, the group want to replicate faster, okay? Okay, but, but now let's really add to the problem we want, it's the size complex rule. So instead of two functions, two tasks, we have P functions, okay? The cell can perform, can perform P functions. Okay, in this case, we write down the benefit in this way, okay? and the cost in this way. So note that here we have 2 over p, okay? That's, that's chosen or to keep the same order of the benefit function as the, the two test case, okay? So what we observe? When the, the aggregate size is a multiple of p, we have perfect isonomic this vision of labor. So we have M cells perform task X1, okay? Instead of talking, of saying uh, task Y, I now will use X2, X3, and so on. So M tests perform X1, M, M cells perform X2, M cells perform X3, and so on, okay? Uh, for the case N, larger than p, we'll have 
our optimized configuration uh, will be like this. So we have M plus one cells perform activity X1 at level X, okay, small x, and M plus one cells perform activity X2 at the same level, okay? So K, okay, so uh, note that when N is larger than P, we cannot have the same number of cells perform the same, uh, the same activity, okay? So we find 1K, okay, uh, at which we will not have M plus 1 cell, we will have M cell, okay? In this case, the expression level of that plate is not X, but it's Y, okay? In the case n smaller than p, we don't have specialization, okay? And the optimization is reached when the cells are generalist. They perform all the functions. Okay, that's the fitness landscape we observe, okay? So it's important that in order to avoid n bias towards larger organism, okay? We don't want to, to, to add larger functions, uh, larger number of functions. Uh, the maximum fitness is the same regardless the value of P, okay? If you, we don't want to give any advantage for, for cells perform a larger number of functions, okay? So, so here we will plot the fitness landscape for the case, we have three functions, six, and ten functions. So, what we see is that w every time we get isonomic division of label, we reach the peak of the fitness landscape, okay? When n is not equal to m times p, okay, we are below this value, okay? But we see as we increase the number of functions, okay, this growth is slower, you see? When the size of the aggregate is very large, very, very large, okay? There's a small variation of fitness with N, okay? But this regime takes longer to be reached when P is larger, okay? When P is larger. So, as you have small variation here, okay, it means that we have more robustness, okay? So this is a region of larger robustness than here, okay? And the robustness is higher for larger P for very large aggregate size. Okay, so here we show uh, results for the aggregative development mode, okay? So here we, that's a heat map, okay? We value the thickness and the number of functions. And so, as expected, okay, that's no surprise here. As we increase the thickness, we increase the, the aggregate size, okay? And for the linear model, what we will see is that by increasing P, by increase the number of potential tasks, we do, we do not observe a positive correlation between size and number of functions. On the other, on the other hand, for compact structures, there's a positive correlation, you see? As we increase P, we cause isoclines of larger, larger values. And then here, I repeat the same analysis. Instead of valuing uh, the thickness, we value the cost, the cost C. And uh, we observe the same pattern, OK? For the compact aggregate, for the spherical model, we observe that increasing P leads to larger aggregate size, whereas in the linear model, this is not true. The opposite happens, okay? Now we go to the clone development mode. In the clone development mo mode, 
we don't have aggregation and we don't have dissociation. Okay? We only have reproduction and we only have cell death. Okay? For the spherical model, the same scenario repeats, and as we increase p, the aggregate size increases, okay? Grows. And now for the linear model, it becomes a 100 function of p. Okay, so in one region we have a positive correlation between aggregate size and number of functions, and in another range we have negative correlation. Okay? The same happens to the snowflake, okay? But uh, the snowflake structure approaches a little, little more the spherical model. So the snowflake structure behaves between the linear model and the spherical model, okay? So we also try to, to evaluate the coordination number of this snowflake structure to see as the coordination number grows, we can approach the compact structure, the spherical structure, and uh, this is not true, okay? So the, the rate of increase of the maximum size slows down as as the coordination number is, in, is, in, is increased and, and tends to saturate, okay? Okay. Uh, so basically, what we can say is that the size complex rule does not always hold, and uh, uh, we see that it depends uh, on the shape of the aggregates, and it also depends on the life cycle. So, at least theoretically, okay, we can see instance that the size complex rule can be violated. That's something very difficult to measure in nature, because when they did that such measurement, they they picked a lot of different species in different filler. So it's very difficult to, to, to have a proper classification for that. And uh, we believe that our theoretical model can shed some, some light into, into the problem. OK, that's it. Thank you very much. I want to, uh, to thank my, my students, OK? Um, and Carlos Batista is, uh, is another professor in my department that carried out all, all these simulations and uh, our, our, our study. Thank you very much. <laughs>